It is always a blessing to be able to speak or to preach God's word, but the ability, the capacity to be able to come back to my home congregation is a great um, blessing. The past two summers, uh, I realized that I've been away for the majority of the time, and obviously with the fall and spring being in college, I've not got to be around you guys uh, as much as maybe as I would like, but I want you to know uh, from my perspective and from my families as well, I'm very blessed to be at the Crosswell Church of Christ to call that my home congregation. As I started preparing for this lesson, I was trying to think back uh, to the time that I last preached here. And it's just something that I do, um, just trying to get my mind ready for it. And I think it might have actually been my freshman year, the, the last time I actually spoke here. So quite some time has passed, quite some things have happened in my life. And I just want to say at the very start, again, thank you. Uh, for everything that you have done for me personally and also for my family this past spring, just give one example. I was able to go on a mission trip to Costa Rica. It was the first time that I was able to leave the country. It was the first time I really did a mission trip. And the brethren here and sisters were able to support me uh, in, in a part to be able to go to Costa Rica. And I'm very thankful for your financial investment in that. I'm very thankful for your hearts, your spiritual investment and us as well. So as we talk about um, one of my favorite topics and something I'm very excited to talk about tonight, what a friend we have in Jesus, I just want you guys to know at the start, I'm thankful that I and my family have a friend in the Crossful Church of Christ. It is a great blessing and it is a great honor. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over the cattle over all the earth and over creeping every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so god created man in his own image in the image of god he created him male and female he created them i think it's very interesting um, that at the end of this passage we see as god begins the entire start of our story, it says God made this, and it was good. And God made that, and it was good. And then on day six, it said God made man, and he said it is very good. And it didn't take long until we get to Genesis chapter 2 and even Genesis chapter 1 that we see that God did not just make man, he also made female. And I think just very briefly looking at this, um, people need people. And the more that I have kind of grown and I've kind of matured, and I'm very much not close to that yet, um, I've realized that as well, that people need people. And that's just not just in romantic relationships. That's not even just family. We need friends. We need people. And most importantly, we need our God. Tonight, I want to look at you, uh, look at with you um, what a friend we have in Jesus. But I want us to kind of take a step back from that for a minute to kind of get a framework uh, for what we were talking about. Obviously, we just went over the creation account a little bit, and that very early on we see that we need companionship, we need friendship. But also I want us to realize tonight that we need to have kind of an idea of what friendship looks like a little bit between us as human beings, as people, and really kind of in a way how we have a friendship with God. And tonight, as I, again, as I was preparing for this, I wanted to draw a very important distinction in our minds. Um, because the way that we look at friendship, just us as people, I think it's very fundamentally, fundamentally different than the way that God looks at it as being a friend to us. And I'll kind of get a little bit more deeper into that into the lesson. But just because we look at friendship one way does not mean that God looks at it the same way. Uh, I just want to kind of give you a little bit of a preface for that. Um, but God still exudes a lot of those attributes. We'll look at that. Um, I want us to see, uh, that's the first part, I kind of want us to see how do we, how do we as people view relationships, view friendships, and then the second point, I kind of also want us to look at a little bit of how God sees our friendships, our relationships with him, how does he view that, maybe in a slightly different way than what we might think about, and I'll tell you a little bit what that means in a minute, and then also, um, what does that mean for us? What are some practical ways that we can better be friends? That's kind of a very broad outline of where we are 
going tonight, and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense as we get through it. To start out with, um, I want us to realize um, what a friend we have in Jesus. I want to tell you about uh, the man named Mr. Joseph Scriven. Um, Scriven was born in 1819 in Ireland, and I'll be honest, before I again prepared this lesson, I didn't know much about uh, Mr. Scriven, but as you might guess, I'll go ahead and cut to the chase. He is the man responsible for the words of what a friend we have in Jesus. And it's interesting because you know, the very first thing that I think of when I think of what a friend we have in Jesus, I think of all the positive attributes, all the positive characteristics that are associated with that. Because um, I think all of you us being here on Wednesday night, um, we realize what an awesome privilege it is to be friends with Jesus. What an awesome God that we serve, how thankful we are for him, for all that he does. Um, um, but Mr. Scriven, he was the one responsible for these words. He graduated college in 1842, um, but tragically, kind of a start to his story, where what popped off when I was looking at him, he had one of his fiance. He was supposed to be married the very next day, but his fiance in 1843 suddenly drowned the day before they were supposed to be married. Now, for me, like that would be horrible. That's awful. That's really um, terrible. It's not. It's not good, obviously. Um, and he goes on with life um, as, and probably not in the best of life. There's not a whole lot that I was able to see about what his quality of life was. Um, but in 1845, it says that he moved to Canada. He was originally from Ireland. He moved over to Canada at that time. And in 1855, uh, his mother became very, very ill. And that's when he sent her the words um, to what a friend we have in Jesus. And originally, it was in the form of a poem um, that, he gave, uh, that he gave to her while she was tragically ill. And again, due to inadequate research, which if you guys have the answer for this, you can tell me later. Um, I don't know <clears throat> really if his mother recovered or not, um, or if this was some of the last words that she was able to read. I really was not able to deduce that. In 1860, and again, this is just a bullet point of kind of his story, um, he had another fiance, and she also tragically died of pneumonia. And things are getting pretty bleak at this point. Um, that's not good. Um, and at the, end, at the age of 66, in 1886, uh, he died of pneumonia. And when I was reading this story, I was just really sad <laughs> about it. I was like, where, how in the world, like, how in the world was a guy who went through the death of two fiancés and his mother illness, and I assume she probably died before he did, if he died at age 66, I don't know that for sure. Um, but how was a man like that able to pin the words, what a friend we have in Jesus? So I hope um, that by the end of this lesson, we can maybe give a better answer to that. If you will, turn to Isaiah chapter 41 in verse number 48. And I, I want to, again, I want us to see how do we start to look at the idea of friendship? Because the first part of this is what a friend. So Isaiah chapter 41 and verse number eight. Now, there are many passages in the Bible. There's not really a, when I was looking at this, there's not necessarily a central text um, that I wanted to draw out principles of friendship. So we're gonna be looking at many different places tonight uh, that kind of gave us an idea of what friendship is. But I think um, when I originally saw this, it was something that really popped out to me. In Isaiah chapter 41, in verse number 8, and this is Isaiah the prophet uh, speaking for God in this, but it's God's words. He says, But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. And I don't, about, don't know about you, um, but one of the most comforting or one of the most powerful things I think that if I could ever hear it would be is if God said you Adrian or you filling the blank with your name are my friend uh, I think that's very interesting I think that's very powerful so what is it really about Abraham that we could say okay if God said Abraham you are my friend how is he able to say that and for that uh, answer we have to go to the New Testament so if you will turn to James chapter 2 in verse number 23, and we get a better picture there. I think Abraham, and Abraham I think, is a very uh, familiar character to us. He's not just um, someone random. Obviously, uh, the very first thing that comes to my mind when we ta start talking about Abraham is 
Abraham is the father of the faithful. In James chapter 2, in verse number 23, it says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. One of the first things that we have to realize tonight, if we are to have um, the proper relationship with Jesus, or being the right standing with him, if we're supposed to be the person we're, we need to be, we have to realize that we have to be faithful to God. As we're going to see um, in this next point of the lesson, it's not a question of if Jesus is going to be a friend to us. That's not a question. It is a question, um, but it is a given that Jesus is going to be a friend to us. And for us, we have to realize who we are supposed to be in that. And for the example of Abraham, Abraham was called a friend of God because he believed God. Abraham was a man, uh, when he was originally called by God, he was in a very comfortable place in life. If we were putting it in the modern terms, in my understanding, Abraham would be heading towards retirement. So he may be heading towards crossbow um, in modern times. He was about ready to just chill, play golf the rest of his life. Um, it's even believed somewhat in his culture, if I remember correctly, that um, their civilization had a form, a primitive form of toilets, which like no other civilization at that time had that. Uh, basically, all that to say, Abraham had a lot of comforts uh, where he was originally from in life. He was doing very well for himself. And then when God calls him, he says, Abraham, um, I want you to leave all of that. I don't want you to stay in the place that you are. I want you to go. I want you to go to a place uh, I'll tell you. And Abraham, maybe like, if we were like Abraham, maybe we'd be like, oh, where's that going to be, God? God says, I'm going to tell you, but not now. Like, he led Abraham uh, to the promised land as we know it. Uh, but Abraham had no idea, really, where he was going. But God promised to him that he was going to make him a great nation, that there was going to be someone that came after him, namely Jesus, as we'll see later, that was going to be a descendant of his. Like, God was going to take very good care take care of Abraham, but Abraham had to believe that. He had to put faith in that, and we really don't know um, if Abraham even had somewhat of a prior relationship with God. There's a lot of things um, that are not known about that, but what we do know is Abraham was faithful. He was a friend to God. The second thing that I kind of want us to um, think, and, uh, think about tonight in this kind of this point is there is a lot of, the term, at least for me, of friend is very loaded. Uh, in our current 21st century state. And by that, I mean, um, I could call someone my friend after going through McDonald's and them giving me my order exactly correctly and giving me a smile. I'm like, oh yeah, Joe's my friend from McDonald's. It could be just as loosely associated with that kind of relationship, or it can mean somebody that I trust very deeply and I have spiritual conversations with them and I know um, that they are going to keep what I say. So the term friend is very loosely uh, thrown around. And when I was, again, looking for this, um, there are several different, I guess, interpretations of what a friend is. Um, there are places um, that friends reside. For example, there are some people who classify their friends of what they do, right? So you have my work friends. Uh, maybe you have your golf friends or your hobby friends. Uh, maybe you have old friends that you grew up with. Um, maybe you have lifelong friends. So the world uh, very much has a spin on the word friend. Even um, Facebook, uh, our very famous social media site, um, if you just see someone pop up in your friend's suggestions, and if you click the follow tab and they click the follow tab back, you're friends. And I mean, that could happen and you've never even met the person before, but they're your friend. So like, what's really a, what's really a friend? Like, is that just something that someone does, or is it something that someone, like, characteristics that they, like, have in them? Like, what really is a friend? Um, it's very uh, somewhat messed up in our society. And this is kind of where I want to talk about how we form friendships, right? How we form relationships and how that's different from God. For us, as human being, beings, just being completely honest, um, a lot of the time, the way that we seek out friendships or the way that we start to form relationships with people it's usually very much based upon what do I want? What do I need? Um, how can I, how can this person help me maybe even get to the goals or get the things that I need? Um, it's very much based upon, it's a little bit of selfishness if we're being completely honest about it. 
um, of what, what do I need, who, who, who am I? Uh, and the thing that makes that different from God's perspective is, and this is kind of getting to the second point, God doesn't need anything. Um, and that's really our entire thing. God is sovereign. Um, when we start to talk about being friends with God, right, and being friends with people, um, people need things, okay? We need to be able to eat. We need to be able to drink. We need to be able to take care of our needs. We need to be able to talk to people to listen to people, to have conversations, productive conversations. And we have these things that God put within us, obviously, that are very much needed. And that's the way we're made up. That's the way that we are built. And God was the one who de designed us in those ways. But it's very easy, uh, especially when we're immature and such and just trying to figure these things out, to think a lot of times, especially in our culture, that the world revolves around me, right? Going back to social media for a minute, um, it doesn't, like, for, uh, when I go on social media, right, I can see, on some sites, I can see who follows me and who am I following, right? And in some sites, it's just, it's just that one-way connection. You can just see total, okay, who am I friends with? Um, but a lot of times, especially as younger people, and that's primarily who I minister to this summer, um, I was very blessed to be a youth intern uh, this past summer for a congregation in Alabama. And that was very insightful to me, just practically um, being with those young people and getting to see day to day, okay, what are some of these challenges that they are facing? What are some of the things that they're thinking? And just be completely honest, and it's even true of still people my age and probably older as well, like we put a lot of stock into what people think of us. Now, it doesn't matter if that happens digitally or that happens like face-to-face, person-to-person. But often, a lot of times, especially for younger people, it's easy to fall that trap of social media is my reality, it's my truth. And I don't want to go too far off on this, but I think it bears mentioning that, again, for young people, um, and even just anyone who uses technology, you can create your own world, your own reality in a lot of ways. So who are my connections? Who are the people that I'm con connecting to? What are they thinking about me? What are they saying about me? And what am I able to get out of that, right? And really what it revolves around, again, that the world can revolve around me. What do I need? What do I want? Um, and that's very dangerous, obviously, because we know that the only thing that can provide everything that we need and everything that we want is the Word of God. It's found in Scripture. It's the spiritual life that we were able to enjoy um, and for us like that can be very difficult that can be very challenging for people to fall in the trap that it is all about me and stuff and what I try to very much put into them this summer and my entire life just serving in general is we have to be all about God and that's really the message of the gospel in a lot of ways is being able to see him but God looks at things um, again differently than we do. I want you to turn to Genesis um, chapter 3 and verse number 15. And Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15 um, starts to tell the story a little bit again of how God was able to do very much for us even though he really didn't have to. And it's, it's, a, very hum it's a very humbling idea, okay, as a person that there is a being in the world that is greater than me, who is more powerful than me, knows more than I am, is able to be everywhere. Like that's very, that's very overwhelming. Um, if you have never been to church before in a lot of ways, um, being able to think about God, who that really is, like that's very, again, it's very humbling. I don't know how to phrase it any better than that. Um, but that God still is overwhelming as he is. And again, I said earlier, in a way, like, again, we're talking about what a friend we have in Jesus. God doesn't need necessarily to be our friend. Um, he is self-sufficient. He is sovereign. But still, he chooses us. And that's the amazing message of the gospel, that even when we messed up, if we look at Genesis chapter 3, for example, right, um, we see in the very first few verses that God had made everything, but then there was a serpent, the devil, who basically tempted Eve and Adam to sin. 
And again, there is nothing, once they sin, there is nothing that they could do to be able to earn God's favor again. But, and God does punish them for their sin. Sin does require a punishment, and that's very essential to know. But God still provides a way to be able to get back to him. Just as chapter 3 and verse number 15, it says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first instance um, in the Bible that we get to see that God promises that even though people, we as people, um, messed up, that we sinned, that we separated ourselves from God, God says, I'm still going to make a way. I'm still going to provide. I'm still going to take care of you. I'm going to provide a way back for you to be in a right relationship um, with you. And that's the very first example. And if you go to John chapter 1, it's another, um, there's a lot of um, amazing concepts that we can look at from all these places that we're looking at. Um, but like, like I said, there's not, I'm not necessarily looked at one necessarily central text. In John chapter 1, in verse number 1, um, it takes us back to Genesis, and it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's talking about, again, it's talking about Jesus. He was in the beginning with God when it says, Let us make man in our image. Let us make him after our likeness. In verse number 14, not only did Jesus help out in that example, but in verse number 14 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God provided that, started to provide that opportunity in Genesis, and through the whole entire rest of the events of the Bible, was able to bring about the birth of Jesus, to be able to come into the world. That was God's whole mission, was to be able to send a Jesus for us uh, to be able to have that uh, forgiveness of sins. If you turn to John chapter 15, um, there is much, um, again, in this passage that would be worth our time and looking at. Um, but Jesus, um, Jesus, is our, Jesus is our friend while he was on this earth, but also um, he had an ultimate goal in mind. Um, it was not just something, again, random that he did. In John chapter 15, um, in verse number 13, if you will, mark your place there, and then if you will, turn back to Matthew chapter 9 with me. Matthew chapter 9, in verse number 15. Matthew chapter 9, uh, verse number 15, the context for this uh, passage, and again, we'll get back to John here in a moment. In Matthew chapter 9, um, in verse number 14, Basically, the disciples um, of John and some other people are questioning um, what Jesus is doing. And verse number, um, they're basically asking him, why do you guys not keep the fast? Which the fat fasting was very important to those Pharisees. It was also important to the culture of that day. But Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, verse number 15, it says, And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. This is um, one of the first examples of Jesus mentioning the word uh, friends, and he uses it in relationship to his disciples, to his followers, as kind of an example here. And for us, um, the, these friends, for example, what Jesus is basically talking about is if you are going to a wedding, that's the way we would term it today, if you're going to a wedding and you are going to celebrate and you're going there again, of course, to celebrate that new marriage, you guys are not just going to be gloom. You're not just going to be like trying to not to eat or trying to remember something. You're trying to celebrate. You're trying to have a very good time. And that's what basically Jesus is comparing himself to. He's saying that I am that bride. I am that bride. I'm the one who is special. God was the one who did send me. He was the one um, who prepared it for me to be able to do the mission that I was told to do. And I am with you now. And while Jesus is on earth, that was, I guess you would say, that would be something that all of us, I would hope, would want to witness. 
um, getting to be there right next to Jesus um, would be something truly to be able to celebrate. And hopefully one day we'll be able to uh, do that. And Jesus is saying there will come a time later. And again, we're not going to get into the fasting part. Um, but as the friends and stuff, we are supposed to celebrate Jesus. We're supposed to show that. In John chapter 15, um, going back to that passage, in John chapter 15, basically this is one of Jesus' last, the last days on earth. He is preparing his disciples um, to be ready to um, leave this earth and go. In John chapter 15, in verse number 13, he's basically talking about the culmination again of his mission. And again, I think all of us here tonight are familiar um, with the things that we are talking about. But John chapter 15, verse number 13, Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Verse number 14, You are my friends, if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. In John chapter 15, in verse number 13, Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. One of the more humbling things that I have tried to med meditate on and realize is what Jesus did for us in giving his life. Um, a lot of times, due to not trying to, I guess, necessarily scare kids or to make too much of a deal of it, um, we can sometimes water down the power of what Jesus did when he gave up his life. Um, one of the things that, again, it brings tears to my eyes, just to someone even think about it, is all that Jesus had to go through for us in leading up to the cross. Um, that was not something, again, that was easy uh, for him to do. Was he the son of God? Yes. Um, so was he able to know some of the things that were going to happen? Did he realize the mission that he had? Yes. Um, he knew exactly what had to be done to be able to bring man back. Um, but again, Jesus had a choice in doing that. Um, sometimes too often, at least for me, um, it can be very easy to take what God did for us, what Christ did for us in giving up his life. It's very easy to take that for granted and think that, oh, I just deserve this, or this is just always how it was supposed to be or how it's going to be. But again, Jesus had a choice in doing that. He chose to go through that suffering um, for all of us, but not only for us as Christians, um, something also like he did that for the entire world, uh, both of that day and this day and all days that have been and all days that have come. Now, whether people take advantage of that sacrifice or not is another question. Um, that sacrifice alone is not going to save everybody. Um, they must accept, they must obey his commandments, as we just read. Um, but he still did that um, to provide that opportunity. Um, and again, that's something that I very much don't want to take for granted. It's something that's very humbling and realized. And that's the ultimate show, I believe, of what a friend we have in Jesus. And again, I think that's something we all know, but we don't always think about fully. So tonight, as we start to think about, okay, we realize a little bit of who God is a little bit. Like, okay, God did not have to make this sacrifice for me, right? And God doesn't need anything from me in a lot of ways. Um, very humbling. Um, not something uh, necessarily that's very warm and heartfelt. Um, but what is um, warm and heartfelt is everything that Christ still does choose to do for me. Uh, so what can I do? How can I use this message? How can I use the gospel in the way that would be appropriate to him? I want us to turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, and I've told you several times throughout this lesson there's not necessarily a central text, but if there is one, uh, Matthew 25 would actually be the one that I would want you to think about and consider um, as we think about how can we move forward from this point. I think we, again, we all realize having Jesus as a friend who's someone we can trust, someone who we know is honest through the words of Scripture. Um, what can I do for him? Like, how can I make a difference 
uh, for him. Because if he's done all these things, like, I can't ever really make that back up to him. I can obey his commandments, and I can choose to love him. I can choose to become a Christian. Um, but that's still, that will still never get me back necessarily. But what can I do um, to be all that I can be for him? In Matthew chapter 25, in verse number 31, we'll start picking up, we'll reading there. It says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then we, he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe thee? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to the one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Now, this passage doesn't use the word uh, friend, um, but I think it's very heavily implied here. I think the best, again, the question is not, is Jesus going to be a friend to us? Uh, he is, uh, through the sacrifice that he has made for us and what he promises to do for us. But we all have to realize, again, overarchingly speaking, um, when we choose to commit ourselves to being in a relationship with God, when we choose to lay our lives down at the foot of the cross, we are saying from that point on, it's not about me. Like, that's the number one thing. It is no longer about what I want. And I do need to take care of my needs. I do need to take care of my wants. Um, but it's no longer about me. It's about him and all about what he can do. Um, so the tension is, it is all about him. But at the same time, God still offers me a place. Um, that's the amazing part. Um, it, Jesus says, come, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for I am meek and lowly. Like, there are passages in Hebrews chapter 4. It says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize for our weaknesses, but is in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. So let us draw with confidence and come to the throne of grace that we may find help to find grace in time of need. We have a place with God to be able to be his child, to be able to be loved by him, to be able to be cleansed of our sins, and to be able to be in a right relationship with him. But also at the same time, it's not about us. It is all about him and about how we can edify, how we can lift him up, how we can shine as lights. Light is one of my favorite analogies. Um, I am not the lighthouse. Um, when it comes to trying to show people the way to Christ in a dark world. That's not me. Um, but what I can be is I can be maybe one match, maybe one spark um, that will help somebody to be able to see Jesus. So it's not about us anymore. But at the same time, we still have a place um, with God. And also, we are blessed. In James chapter 1, uh, it says um, that God is the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness and he's able to give us all good things. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse number 3, uh, it says that he has given us all things, all things that pertain to life and godliness. And as Christians, like, I hope we realize that. I hope we ha realize that we have such an amazing friend in Jesus. Um, but at the same time, let us also realize that we cannot just keep that to ourselves, right? Um, one of the things that the world does, right, um, it's very easy to start to posture uh, with people. And by that, I mean, like, if I know a famous person, which I'll tell you, actually, um, when this past January, um, Anderson and I and several of our friends, we went to a Mississippi State basketball game only because they were playing the University of Tennessee Volunteers in men's basketball. Um, and that was pretty fun in and of itself. Um, but a more fun part also for me as a Titans fan was seeing Jeffrey Simmons, who, if you don't know, he's an all-pro uh, defensive lineman, 
really famous, makes more money than I ever will. Um, really cool dude. Um, and it's very easy, right, in our culture with celebrities and people who are famous and such. Like, I've got a picture on my phone with Jeffrey Simmons. Um, that's really cool. Um, but it's not the most important thing. It's very easy to start to um, posture against people. Um, but as Christians, like, if we realized, I think, more, and the more and more I start to realize of what an awesome God that we have, what an awesome Savior I have in Christ Jesus, I'm not going to keep him to myself. I'm not going to show him on Sundays or on Wednesdays or gospel meeting times or whatever. Um, that's something that I want to show just as much as I show Jeffrey Simmons, hopefully more uh, than Jeffrey Simmons, right? That's something um, that is the greatest blessing in the world. What a friend we have in Jesus. If you look at the lyrics um, of the verse, um, it's actually originally was not um, called that. In fact, uh, originally, I believe it was, um, it was originally a, it was originally called Prayer Without Ceasing. Um, that was the original name of the poem when um, the man sent it to his mother. Um, and if something I've also uh, somewhat struggled with um, as I've tried to grow in my Christian faith is the purpose of prayer. And oftentimes we think, okay, I'm praying to God, but like he already knows and such. But I think just based off studying this lesson a little bit alone and some of other things, I think prayer helps us be in the right posture of realizing God is my priority. And it's not about me anymore, but at the same time I have a place. And I think if we realize the, both of those things in prayer and also realizing that with the world, we can be better for Jesus and show that to others. Thank you for your time.